Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Ottavio Pieretto. I'm connected from Italy uh, uh, at the Slow Food International headquarters where I work. Uh, um, and especially I'm focusing on the topic of protein transition. Uh, and at Slow Food, we have a strong network of legumes, farmers, activists, and lovers. That is our Slow Beans network. And today I'm delighted to have an amazing panel of experts uh, who will lead us through the topic of legumes in community catering. Especially because when I think about canteens, uh, my first thought goes to unpleasant dishes eaten when I was a child. And I surely do not remember legumes in my canteen, maybe frozen peas once in a while, but never lentils, beans, and let alone the wonderful chickpeas. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, today we are here because indeed canteens can be a powerful tool, both for individuals, education, and health, but also for the development of our territories. Uh, and a more sustainable public procurement uh, is possible. And the six great panelists of today will tell us how. So um, I immediately leave the floor to our first speaker, uh, Bettina bergman metzen uh, I let you introduce yourself and tell us, tell us about your great work in the procurement of sustainable food for the Copenhagen municipality. Uh, and also before I forget, as also Anne was mentioning at the beginning, feel free to write your questions in the chat. Uh, we will collect them and we will ask them uh, at the end of all the speeches. So if you have any doubt, just uh, please uh, put them in the chat. And Bettina, I leave the word to you. Well, thank you very much and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy, happy to tell you about uh, the municipality of Copenhagen and what we're doing here. Um, I'm a procurement lawyer. I have been working here since 2009 and uh, I made a short presentation for you. Um, see if I can share it uh, with you guys. Um, see if it will go in present. Yeah, there we go. <coughs> um, so, as I always say, this could be me going through the mountains because a procurement lawyer can often have a lonesome job and doing a lonesome journey towards the mountain and crossing it. Uh, we are often seated by our desks. We often do not talk that much with each other. We don't know each other that well often. Uh, and that's why uh, sometimes we face that we have to incorporate many political goals. We also have to do savings on procurement because that's often what procurement, the legal tendering process are for. It's to see if we can cut back budgets so we can spend budget on something else in the public sector. Um, so so some, sometimes it feels like a, a long journey on yourself. But the role of the procurement lawyer can actually be um, pretty good because you can use procurement to incorporate political goals and put them into life and measuring that they are actually happening. So we have to open up our minds and see that it's not always more expensive to put in um, political criteria to do a more green and sustainable procurement. For example, if you're trying to cut back food waste at the supplier side, uh, the supplier will see that they are also saving money because you're helping them reduce the food waste and thereby then you may have a, a cheaper offer from them if, if you put that into your tender. So it's not always more expensive just to let you know that there is some ways you can work with procurement that doesn't cost extra. But it, it, it can be a tool to actually achieve some more sustainable uh, goals into your procurement. But procurement officers are often like me, educated lawyers, I'm having a financial background and a law background, so I don't know that much about food system or food in general. At least I didn't when I started. I, I know more now because that's in Copenhagen, I, I have been uh, specialized and I'm only focusing on food procurement and uh, tendering and also contract management on food. Um, <clears throat> so to bring the policy into life, I think we need uh, both uh, procurement lawyers, uh, specialist conversion agents who help to know how we cook differently in, in kitchens. We have to have somebody help the cooking changing in the kitchen where, where because that's where the actually magic is happening. They are the one who's using the legumes to cook more sustainable meals. 
And then we have to have a market dialogue. We have to prepare the market that we are doing something differently in the future and we're going to be more green. And then of course we have to have a dialogue with the kitchens, the one who are actually creating the great magic, the real food uh, for the people. In Copenhagen, we cook mainly on site. We have around um, uh, 400 um, kitchen sites, I think, uh, and uh, 1,100 employees to, to cook. Uh, it depends on, and some of the kitchen are only one and some are, are two. But with these dialogues all included in one, we actually had the opportunity to create a difference through the procurement where we put in demands for the market that then delivers, and then we can measure that we are actually achieving more greenable, uh, green sustainable procurement. In Copenhagen, we have high political ambitions, as I said. These are some of the ambitions that we have in Copenhagen. In the last tender, we actually referred them back to the sustainable development goals, which we also committed to as many other uh, countries and cities. So you can also help your politicians look that you are actually achieving the sustainable development goals through your procurement. This is done by food, but it can also be done by other uh, procurements. Uh, but but here we have, of course, the focus on food. We have green packaging, green vehicles, no flight policy, sustainable soya and palm oil, and so on and so forth. And then we're also working on healthy nutrition to the people. So cooking differently, we are putting in our, also um, our dietary guidelines and all these things. So, and here in uh, just when we did the last tender, we had uh, new official dietary guidelines and I was thinking how to do this, how to work in the dietary guidelines because normally when you do a tender, you look at what have we bought lately? Uh, what are the um, patterns of what we buy? And then we look, uh, put in those measurements. But how can I promise that we're going to buy something differently when we haven't even started the conversion going more? We are 90% organic in Copenhagen. So the procurement that I make 100% organic meals. Uh, the meals are 85% organic now, I think, in total. Um, it's all uh, governmental controlled and measured. So, so we know this percentage is, is pretty much correct. Um, but how to measure that we are, or how to procure for something in the future. So we came up with this climate wave saying, we, the university helped us identify what food would be more healthy, more sustainable. For example, leg legumes, uh, green greens, um, um, corn and, and things like that. And then they put a climate weight saying, a positive climate weight saying, this we will evaluate 10, 10 times more valuable than, for example, meat. Meat would just have a one time or so. So it suddenly had a higher value for the tender when we evaluated the price for it and, and the, 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 um, the amount of it. So this is how we worked with putting in a positive climate weight. And then to spread this, because I'm so lucky that I only work on food procurement and that I have this focus, so I have time to think these thoughts, but not all procurement officers do, because often they do food, then they do divers, road salt, heavy machinery, and whatever. That's a procurement officer's job. They just do the legal job of it, mostly. So we create this uh, national food procurement officer network where we work together and we share these ideas and we share how to do procurement differently, how to put in measurement for food waste at the supplier side so they, we can help them reduce the food waste. So all these things we, we talk about in this procurement officer network and we talk about the really nerdy stuff, how to put in what paragraph and where to write when you want to fairly traded goods and things like that. So, so this, and and uh, we also uh, described, uh, I also wrote a book that uh, was published by WHO in English on how to put in uh, sustainable criteria in procurement. So in, in uh, we have different procurement uh, related uh, EU projects. One of them is Best Remap. And here we are building a European food procurement officer network. So all food procurement officers through Europe are welcome to join this network where we can share ideas. And I hope to be able to put up a meeting in January. And I think now my 10 minutes is up. So thank you for your time and you're welcome to contact me by these contact informations. And I'm happy to share my presentation. Thank you so much, Bettina, for this insightful presentation. I think that we already started to see the complexity behind this issue. So thank you very much. Um, we'll share the presentation for sure. Uh, and now, actually, I'm happy also about 
this webinar because we are kind of in a journey as now we we go to Italy uh, and I'd like to leave the floor to Claudia Paltrinieri. Uh, she's the president of Food Insider and the author of the also of the case study that Food Insider published together with Slow Food. So go ahead, Claudia, and tell us about you and your work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ottavia. I share my presentation to introduce the topic I'm going to talk about. Just a few words to, to say who we are. Um, I just show you, I don't present everybody of us. Uh, this is just a, some, some member of our team. I just want to show you how many different competence we gather in our team. Uh, and, and this is, is something that we consider very important to have because when we talk about canteen, we cannot talk only about economy or uh, health. Uh, we have to look at uh, its complexity from different perspective. And so for, for, for us to understand the problems, to talk the right language to all the stakeholders, it's very important to have people like uh, Antonio Chappi, who is our uh, gastronomy, uh, or, or Valentina, who is expert of uh, um, healthy diet and so on. So this is uh, our strength. But we are quite well known as an observatory of a canteen, a school canteen in Italy, because every year we publish a survey. And uh, um, at the end of the survey, there is a ranking. And when we, when we publish the ranking, we publish also our report. We just published last, last week, um, where we summarize all the information, all the data, in, and we take a picture of how is the, the school canteen during these years. And we also track the evolution of the school canteen. This year, for example, the title of our press release was uh, from uh, uh, the canteen that threw away food to the canteen that nourish. And then I, I will and try to, to, to explain you why we talk about it. Uh, what happens when we publish our ranking? Uh, a lot of uh, media, um, newspaper, television, radio talk about this ranking because the ranking is very popular. Um, and this it opened a public discussion about how different is the quality in different municipality. There's a quite big gap between those who are in the top of our ranking to those who are in the bottom. And we try to understand why. Uh, we gather all the information and we have also published a book that is titled is Eating at School, but uh, uh, we also organize events. Uh, um, this year we have got, we, we have organized uh, Ristorazione Bellezza, which uh, can be translated like beauty catering, uh, that we, uh, we have held it in a very beautiful uh, uh, palace in Siena and we, we invited uh, uh, the best uh, uh, school canteen of the Tuscany. We will do another event uh, like this next year um, in May in Senegalia, in a very beautiful place. But what I would like to introduce also is this event that and my is a call to action because last year we, we did this uh, event um, that uh, at great success just uh, uh, by, we spread it by word of mouth and it's just um, a week, we call it the Green Food Week, um, during which the school canteen, but also university canteen or company canteen, uh, change the menu and make it healthy, make it more sustainable. Uh, they don't, we ask not to offer meat, but to uh, offer legumes or millet, uh, a more um, variety of cereals and more organic and local food. So um, then I will give you some more information in case uh, uh, you want to join us on the 17th of February. And Valentina, who will talk later, we, is one of the main organizer. Um, we are also change maker because we are involved in a, in a project that is changing the quality of school canteen of 18 uh, uh, municipality in Tuscany. 
And this is just some picture of a very nice event so, um, during which we, we ask parents, uh, families to come and taste the new recipes. Uh, and some of them are, have great successes. But what is our main power? The power of comparison. And I show you why. Every year we track the quality of menus, uh, talking about uh, the, the, the score that each menu got, but also we take some images that show uh, immediately the, the quality. Last year, for example, with the uh, COVID, uh, the quality decreased a lot because of the plastic that was introduced in the menus. But we also compare single dishes. Let's see, for example, how can be different a basic uh, pizza from a pizza made with a lot of cheese and ancient grain, or a, or a processed fish to a fresh fish that is being served in the region of Marche. We compare also the quality of uh, diet. Uh, let's see, this is a very basic diet, a weekly diet, a uh, weekly menu. Very, there's pasta and rice, a lot of processed food, uh, and a lot of meat. And this is quite different example of how can be different a menu. This is one of the menu of our top, top 10 uh, menus. And you can see the approach is different. It's an educational approach because the fruit is in the middle morning snack. It's not at the end of the meal. Uh, most of the food is organic. There's a quite big variety of cereal, even whole grain pasta. And the protein is never the same, you see? So when you start to compare menus or single dishes, you understand how can be different the quality of the school canteen. And uh, in our survey, what happened is that we track the evolution. And this is a case that we, we, we have studied, we've published in Italian and in English of Qualità Servizi. That was one of the worst school canteen when we start uh, our surveys uh, it was only it had only 44 score and this year it's in the top 10 with 100 more than 100 points more what happens we track the evolution uh, in, during this uh, uh, six years and uh, well, we tried to understand why what was the change and uh, uh, we knew that in 2016-17, um, because uh, parents were complaining a lot because of the low quality of menus, uh, the, the mayor decided to change the management. And so um, the mayor asked Antonio Chappi, who is a slow food man, uh, to, to start a, a new era, era. So he arrived and the first things he did was to teach the cook, to cook, because they were no more used to cook uh, uh, starting from scratch. They were just using processed food. So the, he wanted to recover the dignity of, uh, of cook, teaching them uh, how to cook with uh, uh, good uh, raw material, local raw material. So he, he involved also the local producer uh, to sell their product to the to the to the canteen, and you start building a community. Oh, and uh, how the food change is amazing. The variety of cereals that were just rice, uh, uh, corn, uh, and pasta uh, became uh, seven different kind of cereals. The meat decreased from thirteen to five. There were no more processed food. Uh, and the protein uh, start to increase. Um, this is an example of um, a very popular dish. It is the slow bean soup made with 14 different kinds of legumes, of, uh, of legumes, of beans. And uh, um, they send us a, a movie of children who has finished all the soup and we're very happy because they, they understand the quality. And because the, the cooks are very good now, they really appreciate even a soup, which sounds strange sometimes. <laughs> 
this is these are some very bad i'm sorry very bad picture uh, of uh, other kind of recipes yesterday i was there in qualita servizi because there was an, a big event and they asked us to taste a different kind of recipe and uh, these uh, were um, meat and beans uh, peas uh, uh, cauliflower flan, uh, another vegetable flan, uh, and this with uh, uh, the the shape of uh, heart. Uh, it's a uh, it's fish. Um, it's a very particular kind of fish that comes from Adriatic, and it is the result of a quite popular uh, project, which is papa fish. And uh, on the top right, uh, you see boiled eggs uh, with uh, uh, beet sauce. So what happens again? Uh, the, ch the change the food, also the eggs, and this is another important aspect because uh, when you talk about canteen, uh, they always tell you that uh, you can also use, you can only use pasteurized eggs, but Antonio Chappi <laughs> doesn't agree. So uh, when the um, omelet, they break 14,000 fresh eggs and the quality of the omelette is completely different. Uh, what happens is also the, the, that the, the food, uh, the, the product uh, are mainly local. 70% are local, 83% are coming from short supply chain and the, uh, the organic food increased from 25 to 60%. And also the local recipes is, is uh, entered in the menu. And last year, finally, they have changed all the vehicle into electric vehicle. So what we realize uh, in our survey is that there are canteen who have different kind of goals. The first menu I show you, the goals is feeding, just feeding the belly of the, the kids. The second menu I show you is to nourish nourish healthy the kids but the the third goals is to nourish the community because when you gather mainly the product from the local uh, the local area those who got, get rich are also the producers i interview one of these producer and it was amazing because uh, he didn't believe he could be uh, a supplier of the canteen. And then uh, he, he gathered with other producer, local producer, they made a group and they support each other. When, um, for example, somebody doesn't have carrots, the other producer give carrots. And they had to increase the land to be uh, cultivated and uh, to change the cultivation into organic or millet or legumes. And finally, they, they tripled the business. So this is a great change also for the community, not only for the quality of food of the kids. And this, let me introduce another aspect. I try to be very fast. It's a question of, of the law. Uh, in, 20, in August 2020, in Italy, there is, uh, an, has been published a new law, Criterium Ambientali Minimi, that asks you to do exactly what Qualità Servizi has already done since 2017. And uh, what is, it's, um, is the, the result of the application of this law? We can see in this, in this uh, uh, best case. The law, it asks you to have uh, at least 50% of organic food. Qualità Servizi has got 60%. The Low, it asks you to have biodiversity, like seven kind of different cereals. It has to have uh, less meat and more legumes, and we have seen it. To have no processed food, to link the menu to the local food, to have a uh, more uh, competent uh, chef, no plastic, and to monitor the 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 food waste. And this is another very interesting thing so that happens in Qualité Servizi because they have a tablet. And every day they monitor the waste and they uh, know exactly how much children have eaten. And according to that data, they decide or to change the, ma the, the menu, the recipe, 
or to make uh, some educational project. So mm, this, the, the example of this best case is just to show you that uh, how the um, a canteen can change it just for the vision of management. Now it can be realized by the law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you very much uh, for this amazing presentation that really shows that uh, it's possible uh, and, uh, and that this is the, the road that we want to pursue for uh, a more sustainable canteen and, and, and food system. Uh, and as you have introduced her, I'd like to uh, leave the floor to Valentina. Uh, I think she really fits very well in the Global Bean Network because she's a true beans defender, uh, but much more. So please, Valentina, introduce yourself and tell us about the Meno Propio project. Thank you so much, Octavia. And um, hi to everyone. Uh, so I am Valentina Taglietti. I'm the food policy manager of Meno Per Più, and uh, I show you my presentation. But I am also a member of Food Insider and I work with Claudia Paltrinieri in, uh, in the next uh, events like the Green Food Week. And so. Okay, I think my screen is uh, okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, Meno Per Più uh, is a project uh, funded by an Italian NGO called Essere Animali, and Meno Per Più stands for less for more, literally less animal proteins, more sustainability. We made it very clear <laughs> because uh, we, we, in order to, be, to eat in a more sustainable way, we must move away from, from meat, and that's why we are all here, I, I guess. And um, okay, so uh, we promote a plant-based diet, and uh, in uh, university and company canteens. Uh, actually, we don't work with schools, with school canteens, but only with um, university and um, and company canteen because with you know with adults is much easier. Uh, we ask uh, canteens to increase the number and the variety of plant-based dishes especially the main courses because in italy you know we have pasta or rice or soup like a first course and then the main course uh, which usually is meat or cheese or fish or eggs but never <laughs> this is never made by beans because i don't know how but um, somebody put the beans in the um, side dishes right, like 200 years ago, I don't know why, and, that, and now they are stuck in there. Uh, so we want to move uh, the beans from the side dish into the, the protein section where they belong. Uh, so uh, we work uh, in, with the, a double approach, a theoretical and a practical one. Uh, the most important part uh, is the chef training, because uh, as we already saw in the previous presentation, uh, chefs uh, need, need to cook, need to cook properly, and they don't know how to cook uh, um, beans and legumes very well, uh, be because of also the Italian tradition. Uh, often uh, beans are in the soups or in pasta, like pasta fagioli or pasta ceci, which are delicious meals. But after the pasta, people want to eat something else. And then we, we, they, they want to have meat. So in order to swap this, this protein, uh, uh, this protein source, uh, we want to introduce a new or new dishes with, uh, with beans. So our uh, consultant is um, a super expert of um, plant-based cuisine in, uh, uh, and uh, also in the supermarkets and uh, hotel and kitchen. And uh, uh, we work with the legumes and beans because they are super healthy and we know sustainable and also cheap. 
uh, when we try to introduce uh, tofu or tempeh, which are also, you know, from food from soy, very healthy one, um, the caterer say, says that it's too expensive for them to purchase tofu. So what we know is that pork meat and beef is uh, cheaper than, than tofu. And this is a sign of our sick food system, I think. So <laughs> maybe later we will change also the, the food system, but for now we, we provide the reci delicious recipes with um, chickpeas, lentils, beans, and fava beans, and so on. These photos are actually our dishes, but when we cook in the canteens, they don't look like this, but we can work on that a little later. So um, with the chef training, we also uh, work on the employees' education or student education in the universities. Because uh, as I said before, people think um, beans are a side dish. So it's, uh, we have a really uh, a diet really high in protein, and uh, we need to better understand how to eat uh, how to eat properly and to understand that the health benefits of eating uh, more pulses and legumes and the environmental benefits. So what we do uh, through webinar, poster, and surveys and so on is to increase uh, the awareness on this topic. Uh, also, we do a menu restyling uh, because I think it's very uh, helpful to uh, better understand, well, I, I think you all know the health eating plate of the Harvard uh, School of Nutrition. So to better understand uh, what is uh, protein, what is uh, uh, carbohydrates and, uh, and so on. So uh, after our webinar and training, uh, we offer this uh, restyling uh, so that they can plan also their dinners and to better understand how to balance their daily diet. Then my, my favorite part, the testing and evaluation. Uh, what we discovered, but it's uh, no, not uh, a big news, is that uh, um, people are not familiar with many beans. Most of them, it lentils just in a New Year's Eve, uh, and, and that's it. So uh, we we arrange um, an event, a real event, during the chef training day. Uh, at lunchtime, we invite all the employees uh, to taste our uh, our dishes, our new recipes, and to rate them, to evaluate in, in a master chef way. So they feel very engaged and uh, welcome. Uh, they they can taste a small amount of a new dish without uh, uh, food uh, waste, and uh, and this is very helpful to. Um, to introduce these dishes in the weekly menu after that. And uh, this is a very good moment because um, usually we are there, we talk to, with people, sometimes uh, they applaud uh, to um, lentil meatballs, so it's like uh, a real party. And uh, of course, we also take care of internal and external communication um, because we know it's all about uh, how you say it, you know. Uh, we know that uh, saying that um, uh, a special plate is vegan uh, will not be um, uh, very well approved by a meat eater. So uh, we use the right uh, names and the right tools to explain and to feel everyone welcome. Uh, and uh, we all know that vegetarian and vegan always can recognize what they can eat, uh, so <laughs> they are not our problem. The, 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 our goal is to uh, introduce beans in uh, the other uh, people's diet. This is uh, the case uh, history of our experiment with the um, University of Florence in uh, uh, one day we swapped all the menu. Uh, as you can see from candelloni, which is um, like lasagna, 
uh, to gnocchi with the rugula pesto, from um, risotto to another plant-based risotto, from um, uh, hamburger to bean burger. And then we evaluate uh, the um, greenhouse gases and uh, water uh, saving, greenhouse gases emission and water saving. And uh, uh, it was very, oops, <laughs> uh, very huge, like 440 kilograms of uh, CO2 equivalents for just one meal for 250 people. So it gives a measure of the impact also. And it was uh, very well received and the students ask uh, for more. And that's why we launched a university campaign less than two months ago. It's called Mensa per il clima, literally uh, canteens for climate. And um, well, I'm very uh, involved in this because when I, I was, in the university, I only could eat um, uh, chickpeas and uh, tomato pasta, and that's it. Uh, chickpeas cold, drained, uh, with no seasoning. So um, now, uh, with the students, we are asking the university to um, to serve at least fifty percent of plant-based food in their menu. Uh, we know it's a, a very high high goal, but uh, we are. Um, we have already started to talk with some uh, universities and uh, I think we owe this uh, to the next generation that actually go in the university and uh, to, to build their future. So we, we, we really owe them. So I am I'm done. If we, if you want, we can keep in touch. This is my email, or you can find the menu per più on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thanks, Valentina. Thank you very much for these inputs. Uh, I think they clearly explain the key role that canteens can play, as you explained, also in university, but also in companies, and dealing also with the older consumers, uh, that it's not always uh, uh, easy at all. Uh, and now let's go for another trip to the United States this time. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Becky Ramsey, uh, Senior Program Officer at the Center for a Livable Future of the Johns Hopkins University, uh, and Dana Smith, uh, Campaign Director of Meatless Monday, to share their knowledge and experience uh, on this topic. Uh, Becky, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen and we will see how this works. Um, all right, play my slideshow. All right, does everyone see the right screen? Tell me if you can't. I think we are seeing it in presenter mode. So we also see. Swap that was exactly. Now, is that better? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. It's really nice to be here and just see all the amazing work that is being done. Um, I work at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. And uh, we uh, work at the intersection of food systems and public health, and we work very closely with Meatless Monday. So I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about some of the public health impacts of legumes. Um, we have done some studies looking at the global and U.S. Uh, bean consumption, as well as public health impacts of different dietary patterns. So um, I will cover a little bit of that. Um, you know, I may be, this may be repetitive for some, but I think it's a good background. Um, so as you know, beans and legumes have been around for a long time and they're produced and consumed around the world. Um, nearly every culture has a signature bean dish. Um, although there are nearly 20,000 varieties, only a handful are developed as crops. And the history of their cultivation goes back over 10,000 years. So despite the importance of beans historically, global consumption has not changed much over the last three decades. In the decade before the before this, growth was less than 3%. And then the next decade, it's only pred um, predicted to increase about 2%. And much of this really is related to population growth. The highest consumption is in Latin America and the Caribbean, also Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So the US, US and Europe are lagging quite a bit by they have about one third that of these other regions. Um, consumption appears to depend on income, trends, and price, and declines in consumption is associated with the growth of animal or origin protein consumption. Um, this is 
possibly because beans are considered a poor person's food in many cultures. Um, this image here shows the relative contribution of different legume groups in global production. Although soybeans and peanuts lead in global production, only about 6% of soybeans are currently used as food, um, mostly directly as food, mostly in Asia, and about 50% of peanuts are actually processed as, as in cooking oil. Um, you're going to hear me using the terms legumes, beans, pulses interchangeably, and but I just want to say that really what we're focusing on here are pulses, which are legume plants that are consumed as protein sources. Um, pulses vary in their nutrition content depending on the variety, where and how they are grown. Um, they contain good amounts of important nutrients, some of which are also in animal products like iron and zinc, and others that are unique to plants such as folate, fiber, and polyphenols. Total protein is perhaps the easiest nutrient to match to animal products, though they are there are differences in the protein package. In fact, one cup of cooked pinto beans provides as nearly as much protein as 100 grams of beef. Beyond proteins, pulses get a little more complicated. Um, the protein digestibility score is a method of evaluating the quality of a protein. This is comparable to meat for some legumes, particularly soy and peas, but there are huge variations across different legumes. Certain limiting amino acids require that a variety of different plant protein sources are com consumed to obtain adequate amount of essential amino acids. And the digestibility of proteins further down the small intestine may also be reduced by something called anti-nutritional factors. Um, some of these inhibit digest the digestion of proteins, um, the actual digestion of the protein, and others reduce the bioavailability of micronutrients, such as zinc, iron, and magnesium. However, cooking, soaking, and fermenting reduce these impacts and may even confer some beneficial uh, effects. Deficiencies of other nutrients may also leave crucial gaps if you have only vegetables um, and beans. Vitamin B12 is the most affected. Um, adequate amounts are only found in animal products. And also a diet void of animal products may, may be deficient in choline, which is a nutrient that's vital in brain development. Legumes also contain non-heme iron, which is not as easily absorbed. Um, so that may also increase the amount of legumes and other foods needed to meet iron requirements. So how legumes are prepared and what they are served with also improve their nutritional qualities. Um, generally eating a variety of mixed meals with grains and vegetables and fruits ensure a better, better protein profile. Also adding vitamin C from citrus and vegetables with meals aids that non-heme iron absorption. Um, legumes are associated with many health outcomes, including type two diabetes, lower risk of um, car with lower risk of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, healthier weights, and diverse microbiomes or healthy guts. The intrinsic characteristic of legumes are likely what's responsible, such as slower carbohydrate digestion, higher fiber, lower glycemic indexes, and higher rates of satiety or fullness. But we also can't rule out the influence of just better diets overall when people substitute beans for unhealthy foods. Um, legumes or pulses can also be considered in terms of planetary boundaries or ecological considerations. Experts have defined boundaries we need to keep in the safe zone for future planetary health. We are now in danger zones of nitrogen and phosphorus flows, um, biodiversity loss and extinctions. Land use change and climate change are quickly moving into the danger zones. So let's see how legumes fare in these solutions. Generally, beef is the most input intensive food and also produces a disproportionate amount of greenhouse gas emissions related to climate. Legumes, on the other hand, are some of the lowest emitters. The greenhouse gas footprint per 100 grams of protein um, of legumes is over 90% lower than the greenhouse gas emissions produced by beef. So in terms of a meal you might eat, a serving of lentils produces less than two grams of carbon dioxide equivalents, while a serving of beef produces 173 times that. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, beef and other ruminants require over 20 times more land per unit of protein. And, and it's estimated that just shifting in the U.S., shifting from beans to beef would free up about 40% of cropland. And the water footprints um, to produce a kilo of beef 
pork and chicken are 43, 18, and 11 times higher than the water footprint of pulses or legumes. To put it in terms of a meal or what one might purchase, one kilo of beef requires 15,000 liters of water to produce, while one kilo of beans takes about 360 liters. Legumes also have a unique contribution to soil health and biodiversity. They are locally adapted and accepted. They fix nitrogen into the soil, and some can use soil-bound phosphorus, thus limiting the need for these extra fertilizers. They increase soil uh, diversity, and by intercropping and um, doing crop rotation, they increase nitrogen use efficiency and yield, and they also reduce plant disease. So studies in the US and Europe confirm that um, we have an overall low intake of legumes as we've already addressed in this webinar. Um, but there is an interest in eating more. Many consumers now are perceiving beans, um, however they perceive beans as really hard to prepare and flavorless. So we have a challenge for food industry chefs and influencers to create delicious meals and recipes that are simple and easy to put together. There's a study in Germany and New Zealand that grouped consumers by clusters in terms of the preference, their preference towards substituting meat with legumes. By understanding where consumers are at along the spectrums, we can, more, we can have more effective and targeted approaches and that can be designed to help consumers incorporate beans into their weekly menus. So finally, increasing legumes consumption requires a growth in demand as well as production. Strategic policies, education, and marketing are needed for this to become reality. From policies such as dietary and health guidelines to financial incentives for both industrial and smallholder product producers, to those that support innovation and improvement of products made from legumes. Additionally, education about the nutrition and ecological benefits and marketing of legumes and their pro products to consumers. And finally, I would say that programs like Meatless Monday that we're going to hear about offer impactful strategies to engage consumers, institution, and policymakers alike, and provide a gateway toward increased global consumption of legumes and beans. And I'm going to pass it now to my colleague, Dana. And let me stop sharing, and we will hear more about um, a great program to a great, a great way to um, encourage people to eat more beans. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Hold on one second. I'm sorry, one second. Here we go. Thank you, Becky, and thank you so much for having me today. My name is Dana Smith. I am the campaign director for Meatless Monday. Um, and hopefully many of you have heard about Meatless Monday, but I'm going to walk you a little bit through our campaign and how we actually do the promotional side of um, promoting beans. So just to give you some background, um, you just heard from my colleague Becky at CLF, Johns Hopkins. Um, we work with them. They are our science and research advisors. So all of that amazing data that Becky just shared and the research of beans, um, it, it's our job to take that information and kind of boil it down to consumer messaging. So at Meatless Monday, that's, that's what we do. Um, so what is Meatless Monday? So Meatless Monday is a global movement. We were actually founded in 2003. So next year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, which is amazing. Um, and if you could just imagine 20 years ago, the plant-based um, landscape was very different than it is today. So i um, excited to be here today to talk about how it's grown. Um, but Meatless Monday is um, what we consider a gateway towards healthier diet. We help shift people towards making um, better, healthier decisions in their diet, even if it's taking a small step, like one day a week, we know that that could lead to further change. Um, as we discussed, the campaign is scalable, evidence-based with our work with Johns Hopkins. Um, and we also pride ourselves on being an educational tool. So our website is full of resources that anyone can go and um, get and use. And it's all, it's all there for free. We call it open source. So um, if you're planning on running any sort of plant-based campaign, or you want to promote beans within your um, establishment, you can definitely go to our website and get a ton of resources that are all for free. And I'll, I'll show you some of those. Um, 
But again, um, and we've heard this throughout the conversation, you know, we have to face it. If plant-based foods and if beans don't taste good, we're going to have trouble making that, that behavior change, making that shift. So for our campaign, we definitely rely upon, upon culinary messaging to engage the public and to get across, um, you know, we, we start with the culinary and the food messaging, and then we sort of sneak in, oh, by the way, it's also healthy, it's also good for the environment. So as I mentioned, we are a global movement. Um, I love this slide because it sort of gives um, a broader view of what's happening with Meatless Monday. There's Meatless Monday programs in over 40 countries translated in 22 different languages. And the way the campaign was designed is really um, to let people adopt, you know, sort of the key messages and design it based on what's good for them in their country. So you can see here um, just a few different examples of logos of other countries using um, the Meatless Monday messaging and campaign, but making it fit for their environment and for their country. Meatless Monday is promoted in a wide range of settings, including schools, universities, hospitals, restaurants, chefs, cities and public institutions, advocacy groups, media and food brands. Um, a little bit now more specific to beans. Um, I thought this was interesting. We do a survey every year or two, um, a national survey in the US. And there was a data point that said over a quarter of Americans were influenced to eat more beans or lentils by Meatless Monday. So that shows to me that the work we're doing is really helping with this shift. So, Knowing all of that and knowing how important beans are to us, we built what we call the Meatless Monday Bean Resource Center. So we believe that beans are obviously an incredible food. They're nutritious, sustainable, they're inexpensive, and they're one of the most cost-effective sources of protein available on the market. Um, but really what makes the beans truly remarkable is its versatil versatility um, in taste, in preparation, and in variety. So it's no surprise that beans continue to serve as the cornerstone of many great global cuisines. Um, so as you can see here, the Meatless Monday Bean Resource Center also can be found on our website. Um, we focus on, and this is all, you know, from the information that Becky just shared, we focus on looking at beans for your health, beans for the environment, beans from a culinary perspective, um, then we have the free materials and we also have a global bean promotion, which I'll walk you through in a moment. Here are some examples of the free resources I was speaking about. This is just a few. When I say we have hundreds, we have maybe even thousands. So if you go on our website, and this is specific to beans, but we have all plant-based resources, um, you can use these for your campaign. So you can use them on your social media. You can use them um, in an email campaign. You can print them out as posters or as menu cards. So the part of the campaign is that we do the, the work and then we hope that other people can leverage it to um, promote their, you know, what they're trying to achieve as well. And then of course, we can't talk about beans without talking about protein. Um, it, our campaign in particular, when people write into us, the first question they always ask, the most asked question is if I um, choose a plant-based diet, can I get enough protein? And the answer is absolutely yes. And we have all this information on our website, but again, um, you know, here's ways that we leverage beans and legumes to talk about their um, high protein aspects. And so I wanted to talk about an example to just show um, what's happening here in particularly in the US and in my backyard in New York City. Um, so, you know, I think there's an amazing example of how um, city leaders are taking charge of the health of children. And so in New York City, um, in 2018, they did a small pilot in 15 public schools uh, of Meatless Monday. Um, and as a result of its initial success, Meatless Monday was then expanded into all of New York City public schools, which feeds over 1.1 million students daily. So those students are getting um, healthy, all vegetarian breakfast and lunch menus every Monday. 
But the amazing thing is that just recently, because of the success of Meatless Monday, they just added on what they're now call, calling plant powered Fridays. So the, the students in public schools are now getting two days of plant based menus. And, you know, the thing that I like about this is it really shows is an example of our research, which shows that if you start something on a Monday, chances are you're going to do it another day throughout the week and kind of go along the spectrum and start to see dietary shifts and dietary change. And this huge institution in New York City did just that. And of course, we can't talk about beans without discussing the Let It Bean promotion. Um, this is a promotion that we did in collaboration with Slow Food, Slow Beans, um, CLF, and it's called the Let It Bean um, promotion. And so this promotion promotes biodiversity, local producers, communities, and recipes in collaboration with municipal authorities. So we essentially gathered mayors, chefs, bean producers, and citizens to help educate and promote the benefits of beans and hopefully sell more beans throughout um, canteens and in restaurants. And I'm going to show a short video, which explains it much better than I can. Can beans really change the world? Meatless Monday and Slow Food think so. When farmers grow beans, they help reduce carbon production and use 90% less water than if raising beef. When you eat beans, your body gets important fiber, nutrition, and minerals. When chefs cook beans, they honor traditional plant-based recipes and local culture. When mayors celebrate local beans, they open new opportunities for tourism. When mayors feature beans on municipal menus every Meatless Monday, they show their commitment to healthy people and a healthy planet. And when the whole town eats more beans, everyone benefits. Meatless Monday and Slow Foods Slow Beans Network have begun to blaze a trail throughout Italy. And this is just the beginning. Join us. Add your town's traditional tastes to the map. So I will end my presentation there. Um, I have uh, links here that maybe we could share with the group after that um, link directly to the Beans Resource Center, um, some videos, some of the studies that, um, some research that's been done by uh, CLF and some fact sheets and um, happy to answer any questions if you have. And thank you so much again for having me. Thank you so much. Dana, and thank you, Becky, for this precious contribution uh, and for quoting also our work with the Let It Bean campaign. Uh, and we closed the round of great panelists coming back to Europe. And I had to Peter De Franceschi, uh, head of Vicley Brussels office and the Global City Food Program Coordinator. Uh, welcome, Peter. Please go ahead and share your experience on this topic with us. Thank you, Ottavia. Can you see my screen coming up? Yes, we can. Yeah, wonderful. Perfect. <clears throat> yeah, like the first speaker, Bettina, I also studied law in Rome. Every day we studied up to 14 hours, all those thick books about articles and boring stuff. But on Sunday, I would cycle to an old dear friend in Trastevere, one of the districts in Rome. And he would um, cook for me um, fagioli cotiche, which is <laughs> pork skin with uh, beans. And uh, together with it, uh, fresh, refreshing white wine from Frascati. And it would give me enough energy for at least another week <laughs> to study uh, law. I work for cities, a city network, which is uh, present all over uh, the world, working with small and big cities on sustainable development. And I'm specialized on food procurement and what I want to tell you about is today is a bit uh, a manifesto that we developed for establishing minimum standards for public canteens and a petition. I won't go too much in detail because I'm aware there have been several presentations and you, despite eating beans, uh, there is a limit to all. <laughs> so the manifesto is basically in Europe, there is this uh, farm to fork strategy, which among others has two interesting uh, it's uh, 
was proposed by this the current commission it has two objectives one is to uh, develop minimum criteria on, on on public food procurement and the other one is to revise the EU school scheme which is about fruits vegetables and uh, and milk but also uh, education in schools so we thought how can we inspire and also the commission asked us to inspire them uh, on both and regarding food procurement we developed together with other 60 NGOs working on food, a manifesto, and we discussed what could be minimum criteria that you ask for all public canteens that go beyond the green public procure procurement. What does it mean to, to procure healthy food? And uh, we developed, uh, we came up with seven areas that you see here. One is healthy food, one is organic and agroecological products, small scale farmer support, climate action, the social side and fair trade and animal welfare. And uh, the manifesto, you know, first of all, we are aware and uh, Bettina from Copenhagen mentioned it, all good practice examples that we do on cities on doing a successfully sustainable public procurement, but also in other areas is the market engagement. I mean, it's important to, you cannot just in your room office sit and think about all these great criteria and what kids should eat you really need to go out talk to wholesalers to farmers to organizations say what what are you producing around us in the city in the region and the other one is good governance which is not just vertical meaning uh, the national government you know setting certain standards also on, on diets saying for instance there should be more beans eaten but it's also the regional government and the local one. And depending on the region, this makes a lot of sense, this, uh, let's say, multi-level governance around food. And then the horizontal integration. It's about the climate department, talking with the food department, with the economy department. It's really cross-cutting. So for each of these criteria, the seven that I mentioned, we discussed uh, together what could be a target for the whole of Europe and how to set this target what would be the criteria and how to verify them and that was quite a, a tough one sometimes also many organizations they have sectoral interests one or more on animal welfare the other one more on small farmers the other one more on agroecology then we discussed why propose this criteria and how to get there you see for instance healthy food one and there we basically set as a target that 100 percent of the public meals should be based on uh, on on sustainable and dietary guidelines. It's not so obvious because also in Europe, uh, many member states they have different uh, guidelines, or they are not updated or not uh, not uh, harmonized across countries. Or sometimes you have a local government, a city who says we want more plant-based food or a smaller portion, and the national government's guidelines say no. Actually, there should be enough meat and. Uh, and all these things, you know, so it, they don't go always in the same direction. And then we would typically go into the criteria, you know, that we had also long discussion. It this went over months. So what is actually healthy food? How do you quantify it? What do you ask, you know, in, 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 in schools? And then um, importantly, also, how do you verify it? And the same we did for organic. It's clear in, in, in Europe, especially, we have this strong organic label. So that helps a lot also for procurers. You ask for 20, 50, 100% of it, and you can easily verify it if it's a label. But then uh, we also try to bring in agroecology, which is more difficult because agroecology, the definition is more about principles. So how as a procurer, can you really verify all these principles? Because it's easy if there's a label on it, but uh, a poor procurer, you know, being under pressure, don't spend too much, uh, do it fast enough, uh, don't uh, be let it be sustainable but then again how to verify it so if you don't have someone supporting you an expert it's there could be there's also the risk of greenwashing but we found ways how to do how to quantify this in criteria and then also how to verify it for instance on agroecology it's also about uh, about uh, guarantee scheme, participatory guarantee schemes just for as an example, small-scale farmer support, that was also quite a tough one. 
in the sense that uh, we didn't know what was the definition and we couldn't find it. Politicians love to say we need to support the small ones, the small scale farmers. But what, what is a small scale farmers? Is it is it a hundred thousand dollar? Is it more? Is it five people? Is it uh, how big should the country be? But if you if you haven't defined it, how can you then support small scale farmers? And for instance, in Europe, in the last twenty years, we lost forty percent of them. And if you really feel it's important to have still farmers around the city, also in terms of food resilience and food securities, we need to support it. And so the idea was to how to link the small scale farmers with the public plate, for instance, school meals. Here we came up with different ideas uh, like dynamic food purchasing, uh, where you link really uh, farmers when they produce something or it's in season, they can participate in the tendering or online market platforms like Ghent, the city of Ghent close to Brussels, they set up a market platform, an online one. So the farmers don't have the hassle, the administrative hassle, you know, with the with delivering and logistics and admin and paperwork. And at the same time, the city doesn't have the paperwork because there's the platform who takes care. So they purchase directly from this online platform, like having an online market in a way. Climate action, I mean, that's an important one. And we see also, at the COP this year, food was really big, and it, apparently it will be much bigger even in the in the next uh, climate conference in, in in Dubai. So how to link food and and climate, and this is clearly to put food waste reduction, but also smart menu planning, plant based food, or like Modana said, is plant power. That sounds really cool as a term. That's also I think what Valentina said. I feel is is very important. But all of you said it that the wording. There's a lot about wording and we see that if there is a mayor who suddenly talks about plant-based, that can be quickly getting into troubles. But you all know that, I mean, at least when I grew up, it was all about uh, still the comic about the cartoon, Popeye and spinach. But I think in beans, I want to hear more of the story about Jack and the beans, uh, beans talk. Uh, I love that story. It's really powerful. You know, it's magic. I tried it with my son. He was not so convinced, but I said, in those beans, there is power, there is magic, eat them. But I think it's a good story. And I think it's all linked to a good story also to the children to eat beyond all the facts. I don't go here in, in into details. Well, we also had the, the social part. <clears throat> fair trade was important, uh, at least in, uh, here's a strong uh, fair trade market. So we felt like this banana, coffee, tea, this should be really come from fair trade sources. Although I must say the region where I come from, there is now very fashionable to drink uh, lupine uh, coffee. Wherever I go, they say, "Do you fancy a lupine coffee?" And uh, well, it's not bad. So it's uh, the coffee beans are. <laughs> there is some, a competitor on the market. And then animal welfare. That was also a difficult one because we basically realized in terms of animal welfare, at least at the EU level, if you really want to go for it, there is no labeling. The only one thing that you can ask is actually organic eggs, because then at least you know that the eggs, the, the, the chicken are free outside. But for the rest, uh, there is not really enough uh, labeling in there. Unless you say 100% plant-based, then you know that there is no animal uh, that is, uh, let's say, yeah, I don't know how to, how to say it in cages or, or, or badly treated. So we came up with some criteria, but uh, they were limited. And finally, link to it, uh, I told you there's also this uh, EU school scheme. So what we did, and I put it also in the chat, we launched a petition and we have now over 9,000 signatures and still counting where we said, well, actually it's a low hanging fruit. All children go to school, they eat uh, food there, not in all schools. And therefore we did a petition, first of all, to, to have at least one warm meal in every school. And that's uh, in, in, and the second one against junk food, one out of three children in, also in Europe is, uh, is affected by obesity. And thirdly, to link the food with the with the territory, you know, with the tradition, with the culture, with the uh, also cooking, because I feel here um, at least the other side they often say it's in the name of food security we cannot do this and do that, but it's also food security if you know what to cook with what's there, you know, out there in the region. 
and uh, so happy if you promote it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. Uh, and, and I must say that this hour has really flown by. I sincerely thank each of the speakers who have joined us. We will share with all the participants uh, the link, but also remind I'd like to remind you that the webinar is recorded. So uh, when it will be published on YouTube on the Global Bean channels, we'll make sure to um, share among our Slow Food Network and beyond, and please also share it with whoever you think might be interested in all these amazing presentation we just heard. Uh, and we still have time for some questions, so please don't be shy and put them in the chat. Um, but as I see that by now there are no questions yet, I'd like to uh, leave the floor to Anne. Yes, uh, thank you, Octa Octavia. Octavia, sorry. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. This was so interesting. And I do have one question, but first I will wrap it up as a member of the Global Bean team. And so this was the last event of the year. And but uh, here in Europe, some of us celebrate the end of the year holidays. And so the next Global Bean event for which you will find a link in the chat um, is to start off the next year with a little uh, cooking event and see how beans, as was said, they can be used very in a very versatile way. So this event will show you how to bake uh, with beans and will replace it in the context of a uh, tradition, which is uh, la galette des rois. And I was very surprised that it was a tradition that is not um, observed um, outside of France and Switzerland. So if you are curious about what it is, then uh, check out the event page and register. And yeah, so that was it. Um, and I had one, uh, I see Rima has one question though. So as a participant, maybe Rima, if you want to, if you want to say your question. Thank you for the presentation. I got good information uh, regarding vegetarian food and importance of vegetarian food. We are also working uh, in, the, in, in the slow food and we discussed the same with our participants. But uh, I wanted to, you have also discussed in the training, uh, in the presentation that wastage of food is also a big question in India. Usually during marriage, when they go in the marriage or attend some parties and they they take so much of food and they do not eat and they, they just throw the food in the dustbin. So we are talking on the with our participants. This is also one of the big question in, in India. Uh, poverty is also there, but people waste so much of food. Uh, so we need to talk on that also. Thank you. Thanks, Rima, so much. And also I see that also Lilian actually asked uh, um, if any of the speaker has reflections or actions linked to with developing countries and maybe uh, whoever of the speakers feels like just unmute yourself and and tell us uh, if you had any experience in the in this and also I've seen ah, I just saw that Nicholas also uh, wrote do you have suggestions on sources of public funding to work on the subject of more policies in public procurement for instance eu funds that can be used for actions like chefs trainings and etc i see peter has unmuted himself yeah that's always dangerous uh yeah indeed i th think in, in terms of procurement we run it, uh, Bettina is also part of it, uh, a big project. It's actually the biggest on sustainable food procurement uh, from the commission. It's called School Food for Change. And uh, there we try also, but it's not really on on, on, on legumes or, or beans, but that's, that's part of it. I think in terms of EU funding, I would try to go for, for, for the big foundations to, to, to support, you know, like... Uh, uh, from pro bag to, to to 50 by 40, I would say that would be much more successful than directly. One one question that, uh, and I'm, I wonder how you see it here, I talked also about it with, with Otavia when she came, is for me that I often hear also here at the commission, but also when I talk to farmer organizations, 
uh, is the what I get back is like the profitability of of growing beans. I think that's for me sometimes a big issue, and I, I try also to learn more in the sense that uh, farmers who have land they say, well, Peter, it's all nice, you know, and uh, yes, and we can give you land and and, and linking it to public, but uh, it's not so profitable to to grow beans. I think that's also a topic that. Uh, should be improved, and I'm happy to hear also others how they see it, how there could, we could have more arguments uh, beyond nutrition and so on to to say farmers grow beans. It, it makes sense, you know, it can be profitable and show how. And then the last one is maybe from we did this uh, a podcast. It's called the Power of the Public Plate, with uh, inspiring people, procurers all around the, the globe. And I remember one in Kenya that was quite interesting because in that sense. I don't remember now the name of the person, but they did a national program or at least a regional one on, uh, and instead of cultivating the, the usual stuff that they would cultivate, you know, that people would say this is profitable. They really went for uh, traditional uh, crops and also beans. And eventually the, the outcome was that um, they spent less money. It costed them much less, the whole school meals. And it was more nutritious and uh, the link with the farmers was much uh, much more evident. So also the long term uh, funding, you know, and the, and and the year after they could really grow it again. So all in all, a really win win win. I remember that. So if you check out on, Sp on Spotify or all these things, like the power of the public plate, you will find it. Thank you. And there is a, another question from Anna Rominska. Um, she asks those co cooperating with school canteens regarding the menus, um, how do you deal with one, diverse diet theories, and secondly, diverse parents' expectations? If one of the speakers wants to answer that one. In Italy, we, we, um, every municipality has uh, generally a standard menu, but if uh, parents uh, has children with, who need a specific diet, uh, they can ask. Uh, and um, in, in Milan, for example, we have about 15 different kinds of diets. Um, it, it, it is not, I'm sure that it's more expensive for those who organize the catering to have a different kind of diets. But uh, um, the, the municipality now are well organized to offer a quite wide range of diet. What we have seen is that um, parents are asking more often diets with less meat. This happens, for example, in Cremona. Cremona is the only uh, municipality who has two kinds of standard menus. One is a, a, a general menu, which is very high quality, and the other one is uh, with no meat. And uh, in that case, the, the, well, Cremona, they have great chef, really great chef. So the recipes are very, very interesting, uh, uh, even for children. And that is the only case where the, we, we have two standard menu with two, kind, two different kind of menus. Then you have also diet menus. According to the other um, things that has been said before, the, the food waste, uh, this is an aspect that we have underlined a lot in our last report. Uh, we, what we... Um, we have seen this year um, in our pool, because we have a pool uh, that uh, gather answer from uh, teachers. <laughs> teachers says that children eat less than half meals. And this is really a bad news because after COVID, uh, <clears throat> we have the feeling that something has changed, something has happened. Um, children are more afraid of what, what is served at school and um, it's not only a question of quality of food, of quality of recipe, that there are, I'm sure, different kind of reasons uh, that we have to go deep, uh, because this is really a big problem, because half of the rate go on in the rubbish. 
with the food. Thanks, Claudia. And I see that maybe Bettina has raised her hand, but I don't know if she wants to add something. I was just uh, just shortly saying that that in in Copenhagen actually we have like uh, divided it into two that uh, children from age zero to six they are served food in in uh, kindergartens, but um, the parents every second year they have to choose whether or not they want to have meals served in the kindergartens, so the meals have to be good otherwise they don't prioritize it. Uh, in Copenhagen, we have um, 98% that says yes to meals. And we cook very green meals because we have so high organic percentage. So we uh, reduce meat already um, to do this. Uh, we have at least one day of um, porridge, one day of soup. Um, and uh, it's no problem. We have had no complaints so far. And in school, uh, age six to 16, the parents uh, choose every day whether or not they want to buy the meals, uh, mostly in most schools. Um, we unfortunately have a production maximum of 8,000 meals per day in these, uh, to, to these most of our schools. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's always sold out. Uh, we have a full, uh, so we are trying to build a new kitchen so that we can have more uh, school meals. And then we have something that where we call school food, uh, food schools, sorry. Uh, it, but uh, these schools, uh, they have production on site with the kids in the kitchen where the kids help plan the menu. And I spoke to one of the chefs and he says, well, so I said, well, don't you have a problem with them saying we want pizzas, burgers? And, and he says, yes. But then I tell them that a burger is not just a burger. You can have a green veggie burger. You can have a green pizza with a whole grain flour. And so, so they teach them that these favorite dishes they have can also be green. If you have uh, noodles, yeah, they can be cooked from scratch, you know, like, so, so they use this as a tool and, 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 and for the kids to engage. And we see at these food schools, we have a very high engagement with all the kids almost joining uh, these um, meals. And they also have a little bit more time to, to eat together. So, um, uh, this is, is quite inspiring. And then I worked uh, shortly with um, FAO, uh, where I had a, a twinning with um, um, and Nigeria, I think it was, uh, somewhere in, in Africa. And we actually, uh, even though we are so different from each other and from how we serve school meals uh, in each country, very, very different, we still... Um, had something to share in common because we lack the connection to how it is to green uh, grow our vegetables in the schools and we want to connect the the school children closer to the farmer through the the project that peter also talked about where we are opening up for small and medium-sized firms and, and farmers in a project called coach um and 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 here we are also trying to link it to education so we write into the tender that uh, the farmer has to give presentation to the kids and we are also writing in that um, we want to be able to buy like a potato kit where the kids can have a potato with them home, grow the potato, see how one potato becomes into 10 and how they harvest it and how they then cook it at school in cooking lessons. So we try to link everything together. And that is also what they did uh, in, in Kenya, I think it was. So here we suddenly had something in common, even though we were so different. Uh, and of course, they have very green meals. They, they uh, eat totally different than we do and have uh, other other issues than, than we do, but but still we had something to share. Yeah, it was just uh, to give a view of how we eat in Denmark and also what we, we had in, in common. Yeah. Thank you, Bettina. I think we have time for one last question. I, I know that also Anne at one, I don't know if you wanna ask your question or also I see the Nicolas ask. Um, and what do you think? Yes, I, I think Nicolas' question maybe. So Nicolas' question is, um, it's more, yeah, or I can ask my question as well because I'm taking some time to read it. Um, I was just wondering how to reach uh, policy makers, how to get them interested in those 
themes and is there a certain way to uh, reach the subject uh, or to bring the subject to them to get them more involved um, is that would be my question. Um, I know that here in the US, I mean, it's not easy. I will say that to reach the policymakers. Um, what we found in most cases when something's happening, like someone in policy is making change um, or instituting more health initiatives, et cetera, it's stemming from someone having a personal interest internally and their you know, sort of carrying that on their back and 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 bringing it up the ladder. So it's usually happening because someone cares about it inside. But, you know, in terms of us reaching out, it is, is hard to get people to listen to you and to hear you. So a lot of the success that we hear about isn't necessarily from us cold calling or you know, standing outside and waiting to talk to people or, or anything like that. Um, it's mostly happening because, you know, there's a, a passionate advocate that's moving this along. And, and that's for all cases where we've seen change, um, specifically with the Meatless Monday team, it's someone internally that sometimes even in the schools, it could be kids that are are you know asking for the change so it's happening somewhere internally where passionate advocates are bringing it to the forefront because they care about it thank you then rather than a lot of people reaching a lot of people find one person who is relentless basically I know there's other organizations that, you know, convene um, mayors and city governments. And so if you can somehow get in with them, which we we've had conversations and we've tried or maybe go to conferences where they are, um, you know, I think that's a good way as well. But um, I think, yeah, having a contact or networking and trying to find the, like pinpointing the person who cares um is is key it, that's what i've found i'm not sure of other people because we we would also love to have um you know better guidance in terms of how to get in front of these people does any other of the speaker want to add something on this we have uh two last the last two minutes uh. yes what what we say uh, to the measure is uh, that according to our survey those measures who has a very good canteen often are re-elected. So mm. if you have a very good canteen, you get a better political consensus. And this is something we have seen uh, any time that there are the municipality election, we compare the result of our ranking with the, the result of the politics election. And we see that often it happens those who have worked very well for the community, for the school, and for the quality of the service, of the canteen service, have a very high percentage of vote. The case of Sesto Fiorentino is an example. The measure uh, won uh, twice, and the last time he won with 73% of vote, which is very high. And this is a very good example. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Um, does anyone else want to add the one last comment? I think that then I'll raise his hand uh, and I'm muted yeah. himself. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, that's been a very interesting meeting. Uh, on the point about policy, uh, the point that was made that you you find champions in policy and you you target them is 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 very very uh, relevant one thing I, I i noticed in the last year or so in this area is that there's been attempts by the, the livestock industry in particular to polarize this debate and uh i i think no i'm i can only i can only speak in general terms but i think it's up to us 
and people like us to counter that polarization and prevent it being a vegan a vegan uh, versus carnivory discussion uh, and move it into a, a discussion about moderation and doing things better, living better, rather than this polarized debate that I see in particularly in the United States, has developed in the United States, um, that is, is really upsetting and disrupting uh, rational thinking uh, in the community. Thanks for sharing. And I think uh, uh, I have so many ideas and also in the chat, many people wrote. And I think that uh, for sure, we as Low Food and also the Global Bean will make sure to keep everyone in touch and to collect uh, also the great inputs uh, and to share the, the great presentations. Uh, I don't want to steal too much of your time. It's already been one hour and a half here. So uh, I really like to thank everybody. Uh, and I don't know if I, I, I leave the last word to you as you are uh, the hosting team. Yes, well, thank you for uh, thank you to everyone and in particular to our speakers for coming here and for sharing so much of your valuable information. And thanks, of course, to all the participants. Um, and we hope to see you all uh in the next meetings and we've gotten so many new ideas and insights and i just want to thank you all very much and also thank you otavia of course for coordinating the meeting <laughs> sorry <laughs> thank you so much thank you and uh, and have a great time uh, in the, uh, the end of this year and eat a lot of legumes at your christmas table <laughs>